Hi, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We reach hadith number 23, Bab al hayau min al-Iman. Haya is part of Iman. And we went over haya in, in detail in Madaj al-Salikin, but let's, um, let's refresh our minds a little bit. Haya comes from the word hayat. They're same root. Both of them come from the word hay, to be alive. Hayat, like hayat dunya that's biological life, the tangible life. Haya, to put it simply, is spiritual life. Being alive, not your body, but your soul is alive. So every living person has a soul. That's how they're alive, right? But not everybody's soul is alive. They're dead. Spiritually speaking, they're dead. Evil people, people who could care less about others, people who have no empathy, no compassion, no mercy. These are people who are biologically alive, and they might be very healthy, but spiritually they're dead, right? Also, spiritual life, its function is for you to be able to see right from wrong. When is a person spiritually alive? When they can discern, when they can tell the difference between what is right and what is wrong, what is ethically right, what is ethically wrong, what is morally right, and what is morally wrong. This is somebody who is spiritually alive. Conversely, somebody who is spiritually dead is somebody who cannot differentiate between right and wrong. To them, it's all the same. And these type of people simply follow their desires. They do because their desires tell them to do. It's not an issue of what's right and what's wrong. It's not an issue of rationale. It's an issue of pure I want to do this, therefore I do. And these are the people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls in the Quran, أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَا Have you seen those who have taken their desires as their God? They only obey what their instincts tell them to do, what their desires tell them to do. That's it. There is no higher function in terms of their rationale or their morals or their soul. So, hayat is about being alive spiritually. And as I said, that means you're able to see things for what they are and to know what is right from what is wrong and act upon that. So we've translated haya as ethical modesty. Right? Ethical modesty. You're modest in the way you behave. And haya, which is commonly translated as timidness or being timid or shyness, that is, that is not a comprehensive enough word because shyness can be a good thing it can also be a bad thing right it, oh i'm shy to go and help that person and that's not a good thing right uh so shyness is not the best translation for it shyness might be part of it in certain scenarios but inshallah better translation is ethical modesty right so haya is part of iman for obvious reasons. Based on the way I explained it, I think it's obvious now. Iman is meant to be a source of light in your heart and your mind that helps you make better decisions. That's the point. So Iman from Emin, as we discussed uh, earlier. Right? Iman from Emin, you are safe. Well, how do I know I'm safe? You realize what's going on and you realize, you know what, I'm, I'm safe. So safe, the feeling of safety comes after assuring yourself or reassuring yourself that there is no immediate threats. Therefore, I am safe. That's a process of actually knowing. You, you understand what's going on. There's, you are in tune with reality. Right? So, since so, such a big part of Iman is making correct decisions, discerning right from wrong, you can see how Haya is an integral part of that. Haya is part of Iman. Spiritually being alive is part of Iman. And the Prophet والسلام, says that every Ummah, every nation, has a characteristic that is kind of prominent in that people. And the characteristic of the Ummah of Muhammad والسلام, is Haya, is ethical modesty. And you can just compare. You compare Muslims to Christians, to Jews, to Buddhists, to Hindus, to you know, there are differences. And those differences go back to our beliefs. Because our beliefs create a mindset, it creates a worldview. 
right? It's a foundation upon which we say, okay, this is right, this is wrong, this is important, this is not important. This is important and this is even more important, right? So you'll find certain differences between how a Muslim tends to conduct him or herself versus how a Christian tends to conduct him or herself or a Jew, you know, and if you were to really look at this, you'll find that Muslims, what stands out about the average Muslim is their haya, is their ethical modesty. Right? So uh, Ibn Umar ta'ala an, says that the Prophet مَرَّ عَلَىٰ رَجُلٍ مِنَ الْأَنصَارِ وَهُوَ يَعِذُ أَخَاهُ فِي الْحَيَاءِ فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ دَعْهُ فَإِنَّ الْحَيَاءَ مِنَ الْإِيمَانِ Ibn Umar ta'ala an said that the Prophet وسلم, passed by somebody from the Ansar who was criticizing his brother because he was too he, he was he had too much haya. He was saying, you know, you, you, you're behaving too modestly. Stop doing that. You're not gonna get anywhere in life. And you find people like this. What, why be like why behave this way? It's not gonna get you anywhere. It's a it's a, it's a fierce competition in the world. You have to do it, you have to play dirty, you have to you know, lie, you have to cheat in order to win and make progress. So the Prophet والسلام, told the man, leave him alone because haya is part of iman. <clears throat> now, we live in a world where this is very weak in the average person. And that's a very long discussion. I don't want to take too much time here. But part of it has to do with, again, what do you believe? What do you believe? And we live in a time where Western ideology has extended to the entire globe. Right? There was a time, especially when you all were growing up, where everybody wanted to be Western. Under the assumption that Western civilization was the best. And that there's nothing better. So everybody's trying to mimic it, trying to recreate it in their own lands. And when I was in, when I visited Turkey, there is a very beautiful Islamic museum, Museum of Islamic History, uh, and also the Ottoman Museum. I forgot what it's called. You go there, and in the Ottoman Museum, you just kind of look at what, what were like the utensils being used in the Ottoman palace, the plating, the decorations, the decor, and why this and why that, and where these things are coming from. It was all coming from the West. It was all coming from Europe. Right. There was a point in time where it was opposite. Now, there's nothing wrong with enjoying the technologies that are made from other parts of the world. There's nothing wrong with that. But the idea is, why, why is this what remained from such a powerful empire with such a long history and rich history? Like, is this the most important thing that you can show us about this empire? that lasted 600 years, right? the utensils that came from Europe, <laughs> is this what's left? SubhanAllah. So as a result of that, the Western world, they have a certain way of seeing things, among which is it has to be tangible. It has to be, you, you have to sense it, or else it's not important. You don't believe in it. And that creates a certain worldview. Um, another is that the purpose of creation, why God created you, is to, uh, is to make you happy. Right? You'll find this in their books, their philosophers in the 17th and 16th centuries. Right? God created this universe and made you the center of the universe and he created you to make you happy. Okay, what makes a human being happy? Well, in their mind, it's their desires, enjoying their desires. So God created you with desires, and he made you able to uh, appease those desires to make you happy, and therefore follow your desires. I mean, that, that's literally what you infer from this mindset. And you can see how the Western world is precisely that. It's coming from somewhere, and that where it's coming from is from the Western philosophers of the, of the Renaissance, of the Enlightenment who theologically distort or who distorted the world view through theological claims that are incorrect. So well, Hayat goes completely against this lifestyle of following your desires. It doesn't make any sense. 
Why would I maintain haya if my purpose is to follow desires and haya essentially prevents me from doing that? It says, no, you shouldn't do that. Right? So, and now look where things have gotten to. Look at how people are living. And compare, even if you just compare Europe to America, compare Europe to America in this regard, America has a different history than Europe. All these European, all these enlightened philosophies were rooted in Europe, in France especially. So look at how France and the, the French people, their lifestyle, it's very different than even Americans. Americans are seen as conservative to Europeans, at least for you know, the past several decades. Maybe now things are changing, but Europeans would look at Americans as you all are conservative, right? Because of the different mindset, right? the different philosophies. Anyway, Haya is part of Iman, and we live in a time where Haya is, has, been, has been poked and chopped up and eroded and made weak. So we have a role to counter that, at least in our own lives. And how do we do that? Well, by number, number one, by making sure that the framework through which we view the world is Islamically inspired, and not inspired by Western philosophies. And look, by merit of living in the time we live in, you are bound to absorb some of these ideas without you realizing it. It's normal. But whatever time you're living in, you're bound to absorb certain ideas, certain culture, uh, certain cultures or cultural aspects that don't fall in line with the Islamic worldview. So you know, wherever, whatever time we live in, where, wherever we live in, we have this challenge. It's just about recognizing it's there so that then you can make the next step and start to challenge those, those, uh, those aspects to make sure that how I view the world, my lifestyle, how I go about in my day-to-day -day life, what my priorities are, are really inspired and influenced by what Islam is telling me, not by what a culture tells me, and at this point, it doesn't matter, Western, Eastern, Middle Eastern, South Asian, it doesn't matter. Right? Cultures will come and give us some problems. Right? Not everything in culture is haram or bad, but some we really need to push back against. So that's number one. Number two, part of pra practicing haya <clears throat> is learning the halal and the haram. Because remember, haya is meant to function in what way? To show you what is right and what is wrong. To help you make the decision to do what is right and to stay away from what is wrong. Part of that is learning about what is right and what is wrong. What is halal and what is haram. So the beginning of haya is actually having an understanding of fiqh. Studying fiqh a little bit. Now we can't all be students of knowledge, we can't all be scholars of fiqh, but we can all spend some of our time learning at least the basics of Islam. Right? You don't need to know, you know the fiqh ruling about uh, inheritance. That's a very technical science, the technical field or technical uh, field within fiqh. But you should know how to make wudu. You should know that you know, what is a halal contract versus what is a haram contract. You don't need to be a rocket science to understand this, especially if you have a good teacher who knows how to simplify it for the, you know, for the, common, for the common Muslim. But this is part of building haya. You know what is right, you know what is wrong. Or else if you don't know, how are you, you can't just expect Iman is going to give you some magical powers to be able to see what is right and what is wrong. So that's the second way that we can work to, to building haya. Um, number three, tawbah. Tawbah. When you apply tawbah, I mean, what is tawbah? Tawbah is a recognition that you did something wrong or that you had a shortcoming. Haya is about what? Recognizing what is right and what is wrong. It's acknowledging it. So when you, commit, when, you, when you do tawbah, you're essentially challenging yourself, pushing yourself to admit fault. Not to anybody, to yourself and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And through that process, haya is, is able to, to come about. Right? And there are other ways uh, in which haya can be uh, manifested. I don't, it's not really the talk of today. Today is just, you know, this is just hadith. So go back to Madar al-Salikin and go to the uh, station of, um, of Haya, inshallah, you can get some more details there. 
Next chapter, Bab, فَإِن تَابُوا وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَوُوا الزَّكَاةَ فَخَلُّوا سَبِيلَهُمْ Here, Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, titles this chapter uh, using a verse. So this is a verse from the Quran, Surah Tawbah. If they repent and they establish their salah and they give their zakah, um, leave, them, leave them be. In other words, if a non-Muslim comes, even if this non-Muslim has been fighting Muslims for 20 years, for all of their life, they made a career out of fighting Muslims, and they come with repentance, they say, I repent, you know, I, I want to become a Muslim, and they establish their salah and they give their zakah, we consider them as part of us. We consider them as part of us. So, وَعَنْ إِبْنِ عُمَرَ رَضِي اللَّهُ تَعَالَ عَنْهُمَا أَنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ قَالْ أُمِرْتُ أَنْ أُقَاتِلَ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَشْهَدُوا أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهُ وَيُقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُوا الزَّكَاةَ فَإِذَا فَعَلُوا ذَلِكَ عَصَمُوا مِنِّي دِمَاءَهُمْ وَأَمْوَالَهُمْ إِلَّا بِحَقِّ الْإِسْلَامِ وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ uh, Here the Prophet ﷺ says, I was commanded to fight people or fight the people until they testify that none is worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad is Rasulullah and that they establish their prayer and they give their zakat. If they do that, then they are protected, their blood and their money are protected, uh, are protected. they become uh, sanctified, except in the rights of Islam, meaning if they commit a crime that is punishable with their life or with their money, then that's law, right? وَحِسَابُهُمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ And their accountability is, is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, so what's going on here? Let's start off by connecting this chapter with the unit, Iman. What is Imam Bukhari ta'ala, teaching us here about Iman? What is the new aspect? And the new aspect here is the following. Think about the time of the Prophet Put yourself in Medina. You are this new community that has yet to establish its institutions and you are surrounded by enemies, primarily Quraysh. And there's war, like there's war between Medina and Mecca. And in times of war, well, war is deception. In war, it's all about the game of deception, the game of propaganda. We see it going on in our world, world today. Now, you're sitting in Medina, some person comes, and they're from Quraysh. They come, and they say, I want to become a Muslim. What's the first thing that can come to your mind? Suspicious. You're going to be suspicious. Why? Because they've been fighting with us for so long. I mean, you were fighting us yesterday, and now you want to become one of us. How do I know? This is not just a ruse to be a spy and a mole within the Muslim community. It's a very legitimate suspicion. And we, today in America, we have the same concerns. And every time a white person enters the masjid, right, what happens? When there's a white person who becomes a Muslim, it doesn't have to be a white person, but normally it's, it's a white person, right? What do we start doing? We're all suspicious. And people start to, community members will start to kind of poke this person's buttons. And the person feels very uncomfortable. They stop coming to the masjid. It happens a lot. A lot. Right? That's why these new Muslims, they kind of tend to create their own groups. They feel uncomfortable in the masjid. Right? Now, is there a reason why Muslims are suspicious? Yeah. Well, we've had this happen, right? It's happened in the masajid, local masajid. A big scandal, we know this, right? So there is reason to be suspicious. Just like in the time of Medina, there was reason to be suspicious. But the problem is, right, what if they're actually sincere? How do we reconcile this? Here is one of the answers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they come and they repent, and uh, they perform their salah and they give their zakah, we consider them Muslim. 
your suspicions need to be at bay. You can't, you cannot use them. You cannot be influenced by your suspicions and disconnect this person from the community. Right? So here Imam Bukhari Taala is teaching us what? External actions that are part of Islam. When somebody behaves in ways that is the behavior of Muslims, then we are obligated to consider that person a Muslim. Specifically, Salah and Zakah. These are the two primary actions of Iman, of Islam. Salah and Zakah. Somebody comes and they pray, like we pray. They give their Zakah. We consider them to be Muslim. In other words, let me reframe that. Somebody who acts like a Muslim is to be considered a Muslim. And there are a hadith that also reinforce this, such as the hadith that whoever prays towards our qibla and eats our meat, they are a believer. Why is the Prophet saying this? Again, the suspicion. You have to keep the suspicion balanced. It's a valid, there's a, there are valid reasons to be suspicious. It's war. But at the same time, there are people who are sincerely coming to Islam. So you have to reconcile it. How? If the behaviors of a person is that of Muslims, we consider them a Muslim. We have no right to deny them that Islam. Right? And, you know, a little bit more commonly, the challenge that a lot of Imams have is this new, you know, Muslims marrying non-Muslims. Especially when it's a Muslim lady marrying a non-Muslim man who becomes a Muslim three hours before getting married. Right? We have reasonable suspicion to believe that this person is just saying this just to get married. That they don't actually believe this. But Islam is teaching us, somebody who identifies as a Muslim, we have no right to deny them that. No right whatsoever. An example of that is in, for, in the time of the Sahaba, there was a battle. And a, a non-Muslim dropped his sword and said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. And the companion attacked, killed him. He still attacked and killed him. Word got to the Prophet والسلام, and the Prophet called him Usama, Usama bin Zayd. He said, Ya Usama, did you kill him after he said La ilaha illallah? He said, Ya Rasulullah, he just said that to escape death. He didn't mean it. The Prophet said, did you kill him after he said La ilaha illallah? He said, Ya Rasulullah, he only said that to escape death. He knew he was, that's it, he's cornered. He said, did you open his heart to see whether he said that? just to escape the battle or if he was actually sincere. So we have no right to deny somebody their Islam if they identify as a Muslim. Even more so if they behave in the way that Muslims behave. Salah and Zakat. Right? So externalities are part of Iman. And when we look at other people behaving with the behaviors of Iman, we consider them as a believer, as a mu'min. Right. Now, another part of this hadith, this is a very controversial hadith. Why? Because it starts off by saying, I was commanded to fight people. Like, an-nas. I was commanded to fight the people. Until they accept Islam. So people will come and they'll harass the Muslims and try to bully them by saying, look, your religion is all about violence and you're commanded to fight humanity and fight everybody until they become a believer. Right? Islam spread by the sword. Right? They all say, they, then they use this hadith. Right? First of all, first of all, did you forget, O oh person, what Bush would, was saying when he invaded Iraq? What was he saying? We've come to liberate the people. We've come to bring democracy to Iraq. We've come to spare them from the dictator. Remember that? So, do you believe, O oh Westerner, it is a valid reason to invade a country to bring them democracy. They're going to say, oh, democracy is freedom, democracy is better, we're liberating them. Yeah, okay, then we're doing the same thing. We'll agree to disagree. Right? But that's not Islam. That's not the way we behave. And there's a lot that can be said here. Again, I'm not going to go into all the details. But all you need to do is open the renowned books that explain Bukhari. There are many. 
the most renowned, was written a good 600 years ago, before the Enlightenment, before the Western world, before democracy, right, or modern democracy, before all of this stuff, and see what the scholars said about this. Ibn Hajar ta'ala says, the majority of scholars understood this statement, I was commanded to fight the people, the people who is meant by the people is specifically Quraysh. Quraysh is the people, right? Not all of humanity. So we are to understand this hadith as I was commanded to fight Quraysh until they accept Islam. Or if you want to be a little bit broader, I was commanded to fight the Arabs, specifically of Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula. I was commanded to fight the tribes of Arabia until they accept. This area, this geographic area, it's Islam or you have to leave. That's what it is. Beyond this, no, there is no coercion in religion. And you see this in the expansions of the, uh, the Muslim armies. How they entered Iraq, how they entered Syria or the Levant, how they entered North Africa. Muslims were a numerical minority for the first 350 years of Islamic history. Meaning after all the conquests, after the fall of the Umayyads, you're in the middle of the Abbasid dynasty, historically speaking, Muslims only then became 50% of the population. What does that tell you? Were people coerced into Islam? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, there are Western, non, non-Muslim, non-Muslim historians who researched the demographic changes in the Muslim world over the course of about a thousand years or so. What do they find? They found a steady incline. Again, which tells you what? That people were entering into Islam through non-coercive means. If, I, if we were forcing people to enter Islam, what you'd find is this. Everyone just goes up at once. Right. But no, it was a slow incline over the course of 300, over the course of like 500 years. Right. And interestingly enough, the time periods where you see a greater increase of people entering into Islam was during the time of political unrest and turmoil. Meaning when the Muslim governments were weaker, that's when more people are entering Islam. When Muslim governments are stronger, you find less people entering into Islam. And that's very interesting. You know, in the Mongol era, so after the fall of the Khilafah, uh, when the Crusaders entered, the Mongols entered the Muslim world, you see a massive increase in Muslims uh, and people entering Islam. It is in this era where West Africa enters Islam and Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, this area, Singapore, these areas become Muslim in, these, in this time, which tells you what? It has nothing to do with politics, it has nothing to do with political force, it has nothing to do with economics. The Muslims were struggling at that time. And in our times today, same thing. You have a tremendous increase of people entering into Islam. It, it's not our government's doing it, or at least it's not the Muslim government's doing it. They could care less. Most of them are fighting, you know, are trying to suppress Muslim movements. Right? So where's all that coming from? It's coming from the da'wah. Right? When the politics is weak, Muslims channel their energy in different areas, and that is da'wah. Allahu <clears throat> alam. So, bab man qala inna al-imana huwa al-amal. The chapter, uh, those who say, Iman is action. An Abi Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala an anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam su'ila ayu al-a'mali afdal qal iman billahi wa rasulih wa rasulih qil thumma madha qal al-jihadu fi sabilillah qil thumma madha hajjul mabrur. So remember when I introduced this book I mentioned how when a scholar writes a book he is, he is addressing issues of his time. Right? If I were to write a book today, I'm not going to be writing a book based on what I think the problems are going to be 300 years from today. 
I'm writing a book that is directly addressing the problems of today or the issues of, the t of today or the questions of today. And this is one of the most common mistakes of students of knowledge of Islam. When they read a book, they think they're reading a universal manual that the author wrote in a way that's meant to be understood exactly the same in every single time and place. That's not how it works. Yes, there are certain foundations of the religion that do not change, like the pillars of faith, the pillars of Islam. Right? But beyond this, when Imam al-Tahawi wrote his book on Aqidah, there are certain things that are universal. But there are many other discussions he has that is addressing the issues of his time, not the issues of our time. If somebody today were to write a book of Aqidah, aside from the, talking about the pillars of Iman and Islam, you're going to have a very different, uh, very different issues being addressed. You're going to address uh, you're going to address secularism. You're going to address liberalism. You're going to address feminism. You're going to address uh, what they call the Red Pill Movement, the, man, it's like the, the men movement or whatever you want to call it. This is what's going to be addressed. Because these are the issues facing our times today. Okay. So when we read Bukhari, we have to ask the question, what was he addressing? What was he talking to? What was going on in his time? And one of the things that was going on in his time was this notion of irja? Did I talk to you all about this? Maybe I did. Uh, I don't remember. So those who are saying that your actions play no role and are meaningless to your iman. Your actions play no role and are irrelevant to the strength or the weakness of your iman. So here Imam Bukhari is saying actions and Iman are so intertwined, you can't separate the two. You can't. So he's pushing back against that. Now, why is this important? You know, some people say, look, all this is silly. Why were they even talking about this? What does it matter? No, it doesn't matter because it creates a framework. If I believe that actions are irrelevant to Iman, how am I going to live life? Well, we don't really need to go f too far. I mean, look at Christianity. Jesus died for your sins. You're forgiven. I'm forgiven? Yeah, so if I do whatever I want, I'm forgiven? So they do whatever you want. They do what they want. Right? So if people, if a person believes that I can drink, I can cheat, I can steal, I can gamble, and that's meaningless to the level of my iman, then why not? That's very different than somebody who believes that every syllable I, I, I pronounce is being accounted for, is being written down, and I'll be accountable for that. Now I have to consider everything I do, every step that I take. Imam Hassan al-Basri says that I never took a step except that I asked myself the question, is this in the obedience of Allah or no? If it was in the... If I, conclude that it's in the obedience of Allah, I go forward with it. But if I conclude that it's not in the obedience of Allah, I leave it. Right? I mean, that's just, where is that coming from? The belief that my actions matter. I mean, even his footsteps, to him in his mind, were meaningful. They played a role. It can get him somewhere or it can get him somewhere he doesn't want to be. So actions are intertwined with Iman to where your actions impact your Iman. When a person's iman gets weaker, it is most likely the result of their actions. When a person's iman gets stronger, it is most likely, not necessarily, but most likely a result of their actions. It plays a role. Now, it's a very interesting topic, right? Even in the psychological realm, psycho-spirituality, I think it's called. Like, what is the relationship between your actions and your spirituality? How does your actions affect your spirituality. Very complex because spirituality is, is a realm that it's very vague. Like we don't, it's not like the body where you can actually look and see how it's impacted. You can put wires on your brain and see how your brain is functioning in reaction to things. You can't do that with spirituality. At least we don't know how to. Um, but anyway, here, Abu Hurairah said that the Prophet was, was asked, what actions are the best? 
Right? What actions are the best? So the Prophet ﷺ said, belief in Allah and His Messenger. Tawheed. Obviously, it's the best. Then the man said, what after that? The Prophet said, jihad fi sabilillah. Striving for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, in the time of the Prophet, what's meant by this is the actual military jihad. Right? The military jihad. Back then, it was critical and extremely important for his time. That was their context. Qil thumma madha. And then he asked, okay, what after that? He said, the Prophet said, hajjul mabrur, and accepted hajj. Now, as we go through this unit, you'll find other hadith that start the same way. Somebody asked the Prophet والسلام, what actions are the best? And what you'll find is that the Prophet's answer is different every time. Question is, why? The answer to that is, the Prophet is answering according to the one asking. To the one asking. So if it's a young man who's asking the Prophet, the Prophet will say one, two, three. If it's a man maybe in his 40s, the Prophet will say one, two, three. If it's a man in his 70s, the Prophet will say one, two, three. If it's a lady, the Prophet will say one. He's giving each person a, a response that is relevant to them. Right? So hopefully that undoes the, the confusion. Now how do we benefit from this? Well, we need to understand what is my context? What is my reality? And what are my strengths and what are my weaknesses? What's going on in my life so that I can better understand what I should channel my energy doing? So obviously Iman in Allah and His Messenger comes first. And this is a summarized way of saying you take care of the pillars of your faith. You have to do your salah, you have to do your zakah, you have to do, right? And as well as the pillars of Iman. As for jihad fi sabilillah, this is probably a younger person, a younger person, right? A younger person. So clearly somebody who's 70, the Prophet is not going to say, Yalla, go and you know, pick up the sword and, and do it. Probably a younger man. Also, this man probably has siblings. Uh, or his parents are passed away. Why? Because what we know, the Prophet is not if he knows a man, is the only male child. For his parents, he'd say, go take care of your parents. That's your jihad. Right? Or his parents were younger where they don't need that support. Or his parents were passed away, so there's, there's nothing there to, for him to do. Or he has siblings who can take care of that while he's doing something else. Right? But jihad fi sabilillah, you know, the context. For us today, there's a lot of jihad. And there's a lot of need for jihad. But our jihad isn't militarily. Our jihad is intellectually, politically, political activism, what I mean. We Muslims need to take this concept seriously, a lot more seriously. And everybody's so focused on their own personal lives, making a living for themselves. I understand times are difficult. The economy is, is not in the best circumstance. Everything is expensive. I understand that. May Allah bless you for taking on that role. There's reward in that. But at the same time, when we don't push back against the evil people, children get killed. Children get killed. Genocide happens. This is serious stuff. And I'm talking to myself before I talk to anybody else. People don't want to get into this because it's inconvenient. And because you'll be targeted. Because you'll be mocked and attacked uh, verbally, maybe even physically. It's a scary thing. But look, isn't that a small price to pay? If that means saving the life of a child, isn't that a small price to pay? Isn't that a noble price to pay? And again, to be reiterate here, I'm talking about intellectual, ideological, and political activism. These are forms of jihad. Right? In fact, these are the greater forms of jihad. As Allah subhanahu says, وَجَاهِدُهُمْ بِهِ جِهَادًا Kabira, a greater jihad, the jihad of intellectual discussion, intellectual discourse, the jihad of ideology. Right? And you can include in that the political activism, because it's ideological to a great extent. And this is what tends to change societies, inshallah, for 
the better, at least if we're at the forefront of this. Alhamdulillah, there are a lot of people doing a lot of great work. But we need more people on the ground. We, Wallahi, we really do. We really do. Um, and again, I speak to myself before I speak to anybody else. After that, Hajj Mabrur, an accepted Hajj. Right? Again, this man is probably a younger, younger in age. He has that energy, that zeal to go and, and do this. For some people, they can't afford Hajj. Or if they could afford Hajj, it's just once in a lifetime thing, especially with the prices today. As if you can even afford it, right? So, Hajj might not be the best of actions for us today. In fact, a lot of people, after doing their obligatory Hajj, they would rather use that, that money for the poor people. That's a very valid point. Don't buy into this, this uh, boycott hedge stuff. Boycott hedge and umrah. Don't buy into that. These are people who are politicizing acts of worship. Hajj and umrah. Hajj is, an, is a pillar of Islam. You have to do hajj if you can financially afford it and you're physically capable of and the scholar said, we perform hajj with righteous leaders and with corrupt leaders. So hate Al Saud as much as you want, that's irrelevant to the fact that hajj is an obligation upon you. And that doesn't change the fact that there are, such, there are great spiritual gains from hajj and umrah. You have to develop yourself. Hajj and umrah are a wonderful way of developing your spirituality, refreshing your spirituality, reattuning yourself with the Ummah. You know, they say, what's the happiest place on earth? What do they say is the happiest place on earth? Disney. 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 La Allah. Last time I was at Umrah, this is the happiest place on earth. Everybody's smiling. Everybody's so happy. And you look at all these people from all the corners of the world. And you have these young people go and they're, they're looking or they're in shock. This is what I belong to? This is the ummah I'm a part of. All different skin colors, all different sizes, all different heights, all different languages. And they see the beauty of Mecca and Medina and these masajid. Right? They see the beauty. They feel the power and the izzah. They hear the adhan and hundreds of thousands of people going to the masjid all together with, a, with smiles on their faces, hearing beautiful recitation. Right? This empowers people. So don't buy into this whole boycott Hajj and Umrah because Al Saud is corrupt. Hate them as much as you want. Allah, I could care less. But that, th those who are calling to that are politicizing Hajj and Umrah. And that is wrong. And that is against our Sharia. And it's against what the scholars said. Do Hajj and Umrah as much as you want. But if you're the type of person who said, Alhamdulillah, I did Hajj, I did my Umrah, I've seen it, I'd rather use my money to help poor people, may Allah bless you. Nothing wrong with that. All right. Wa Hajjun Mabrur. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and stop there. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in.